The Variational Quantum Eigensolver, or VQE, is one of the earliest hybrid quantum classical algorithms, and it's interesting for several reasons. First, as we'll see in this video, it is a promising approach for some types of problems. Secondly, it's important historically and has paved the way for many enhanced algorithms such as ADAPT VQE. And finally, VQE is fairly simple. It's easy to understand what the quantum and classical computers do in this algorithm and how they interact. There are four main components of a VQE calculation. First, there's an operator, often a Hamiltonian, which we'll call H, that describes a property of the system that you wish to optimize. Another way of saying this is that you're seeking the eigenvector of this operator that corresponds to the minimum eigenvalue. We often call that eigenvector the ground state. Next, there's an Ansatz, a German word meaning approach. This is a quantum circuit that prepares a quantum state approximating the eigenvector you're seeking. Really, the Ansatz is a family of quantum circuits because some of the gates in the Ansatz are parametrized. That is, they are fed a parameter which we can vary. This family of quantum circuits can prepare a family of quantum states approximating the ground state. Next, we need an estimator, a means of estimating the expectation value of the operator H over the current variational quantum state. Sometimes what we really care about is simply this expectation value, which we call a cost function. Other times we care about a more complicated function that can still be written starting from one or more expectation values. Finally, we need a classical optimizer an algorithm that varies parameters to try to minimize this cost function. Let's outline the problem we want to solve and the general approach before addressing how quantum plays a role. We can cast many optimization problems critical to science and industry as matrix eigenvalue problems. Commonly, you want the minimum eigenvalue of your matrix and the eigenvector that corresponds to it. The matrix H could be a Hamiltonian describing the energy of a physical system, and the minimum eigenvalue would be the ground state energy, E0, and the eigenvector would be the corresponding quantum ground state, often denoted psi sub zero. Or the matrix could describe a complicated cost function associated with combinatorial optimization problems, such as in logistics, and the eigenstate psi sub opt would be an optimal solution of the problem, like a binary string labeling a cut in a graph of a distribution network. In practice, it's common to hear the term Hamiltonian used for all matrices of interest, even outside the physical sciences. Let's say we're interested in a matrix with n rows and n columns. Such problems can be solved quickly and exactly using classical eigensolvers for n up to a few hundred or thousand with no assumptions made about the matrix. For sparse matrices, those with mostly zeros as entries, this can be much larger, with n as high as a billion even on a laptop. But for truly enormous problems that exceed these numbers, approximate or heuristic methods are often required. The larger the matrix and the less sparse, the less tractable the problem and the more clever tricks must be employed. Suppose your matrix is so large that exact diagonalization is not an option. Suppose further that you know enough about your problem that you can make some guesses about the overall structure of the target eigenstate, and you want to probe states similar to your initial guess to see if your cost or energy can be lowered further. This is a variational approach, and it's one method that is used when exact diagonalization is not an option. Using a classical computer, this would work as follows. First, you make a guess state with some parameters theta that you will vary. Although this initial guess could be random, that is not advisable. We want to use knowledge of the problem at hand to tailor our guess as much as possible. Second, we would calculate the expectation value of the operator with the system in that state. Third, we would alter the variational parameters and repeat. Fourth, we would use accumulated information about the landscape of possible states in your variational subspace to make better and better guesses and approach the target state. The variational principle guarantees that our variational state cannot yield an eigenvalue lower than that of the target ground state. 
So the lower the expectation value, the better our approximation of the ground state. Let's talk about the difficulty of each step in this approach. Setting or updating parameters is computationally easy. The difficulty there is in selecting useful, physically motivated initial parameters. Using accumulated information from prior iterations to update parameters in such a way that you approach the ground state is non-trivial, but classical optimization algorithms exist that do this quite efficiently. This classical optimization is only expensive because it may require many iterations. In the worst case, the number of iterations may scale exponentially with n. The most computationally expensive single step is almost certainly the expectation value of your matrix using a given state. The n by n matrix must act on the n element vector, which corresponds to order n squared multiplication operations in the worst case. This must be done at each iteration of parameters. For extremely large matrices, this has high computational cost. Now imagine relegating this portion of the calculation to a quantum computer. Instead of calculating this expectation value, you estimate it by preparing the state psi of theta on the quantum computer using your variational ansatz and then making measurements. Let's pick that apart a bit. H is generally not easy to measure. For example, it could be made up of many non-commuting Pauli x, y, and z operators. But h can be written as a linear combination of terms, h sub alpha, each of which is easily measurable. For example, Pauli operators or groups of bitwise commuting Pauli operators. The expectation value of h over the state psi is the weighted sum of expectation values of the constituent terms h alpha. This expression holds for any state psi, but we will specifically be using it with our variational state psi of theta. Each of the terms h alpha can be measured m times, yielding measurement samples s sub alpha j, with j running from 1 to m, and returns an expectation value and a standard deviation. We can sum these terms and propagate errors through the sum. This requires no large-scale multiplication nor any process that necessarily scales like n squared. Instead, it requires multiple measurements on the quantum computer. If you don't need too many of those, this approach could be efficient. And that's the quantum part of VQE. But let's talk about reasons why this might not be efficient. One reason for many measurements is to reduce the statistical uncertainty in your estimates for very high precision calculations. Another reason is the number of Pauli strings required to span your entire matrix. Because Pauli matrices, plus the identity, span the space of all operators of a given dimension, we are guaranteed that we can write our matrix of interest as a weighted sum of Pauli operators, as we did before. Here, C alpha is a numerical coefficient and H alpha is a string of Pauli operators acting on all the qubits describing your system. H alpha would have a form like this, where the nth Pauli operator from the right acts on the nth qubit. So we can measure our operator by measuring a series of Pauli operators, but we cannot measure all of those Pauli operators simultaneously. Pauli operators, excluding the identity, do not commute with each other if they are associated with the same qubit. For example, we can measure IZIZ and ZZXZ simultaneously because we can measure I and Z simultaneously for the third qubit. And we can know I and X simultaneously for the first qubit. But we cannot measure all Zs and z, 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 x simultaneously, because z and x do not commute and both act on the zeroth qubit. So we decompose our matrix H into a sum of polys acting on different qubits. Some elements of that sum can be measured all at once. We call this a group of commuting polys. Depending on how many non-commuting terms there are, we may need many such groups. Call the number of such groups of commuting Pauli strings NGCP. If NGCP is small, this could work well. 
If H has millions of groups, this will not be useful. You record the expectation value, or the cost function, for the set of parameters theta used in your state, and then you update the parameters. Over time, you could use the expectation values or cost function values you've estimated to approximate a gradient of your cost function in the subspace of states sampled by your ansatz. Both gradient-based and gradient-free classical optimizers exist. Both suffer from potential trainability issues like multiple local minima and large regions of parameter space with near zero gradient called barren plateaus. So will VQE solve all your toughest problems? No. But being better at all calculations was never the point. We've shifted what determines the computational cost. Look at what we've traded. We've shifted from a process whose complexity depends only on matrix dimension to one that depends on required precision and the number of non-commuting poly operators that make up the matrix. The last bit has no analog in classical computing. Based on these new dependencies for sparse matrices or matrices involving few non-commuting poly strings, this process may be useful. This is the case for systems of interacting spins, for example. For dense matrices, it may be less useful. We know, for example, that chemical systems often have Hamiltonians that involve hundreds, thousands, even millions of poly strings. There has been interesting work done to reduce this number of terms, but chemical systems may be better suited to some of the other algorithms we'll discuss in this course. Effective use of VQE also requires that we know attributes of our target state and can select a good physically motivated initial state, as well as a good ansatz with relatively few variational parameters. This can be quite challenging. VQE demonstrates how the strengths of classical and quantum computers can be combined. Without adding more recent methods, VQE does not help us solve problems that are intractable for classical computers but it continues to play a role in algorithm development. And VQE also teaches us that transferring a step from classical to quantum computers is neither better nor worse for all purposes. Rather, it changes what factors determine the efficiency of your algorithm. This is an important general lesson in quantum classical hybrid computing.